Fine. Hi and good morning to everyone in the US and it's good afternoon here from London. I'm actually in the UK with my panelists and we're talking about a very, very important topic. I mean, there's so many important topics going around the world today, but this one is obviously about poverty and how COVID management has diluted poverty and the reduction plans that we were all on a wonderful track to solve poverty. For about 25 years, it was actually declining. And now because of COVID, conflict and also climate change, it is dramatically increasing. Um, alone, just with climate change, it's increasing from 68 million people to 135 million into severe poverty by 2030. And with COVID, it's also increasing it by 88 million to 115 million people living in extreme poverty. That was the increase just in 2020 alone. So obviously it's a huge issue. Um, the World Bank has been talking about this extensively. And what does it mean when we talk about poverty on a day-to-day -day level? We mean that kids don't go to school, mortality rates may be affected, malnutrition rates are affected, the quality of water, and many other indicators. So it's kind of a novel virus that's disrupting everything from daily lives to international trade. Um, and obviously the poorest are enduring the highest incidence of the disease and suffering the highest death rates worldwide, um, you know, from COVID. And like I said, it's, it's done a huge damage. We won't talk too much about, you know, the conflict and the, the climate change, which is obvious contributors to poverty. We're going to try and focus on COVID and initiatives that are happening. And each of our panelists have different perspectives on this. So let me introduce our panelists. So we have Donnie here and Donnie is from Beijing and he owns a company called Four Stones Consulting. Um, and basically he's created intercultural initiatives between China and the rest of the world to help um, you know, facilitate more successful businesses, mergers, all those kind of things that, that intercultural cross communications might do. Um, but he has a lot to say about you know, what China's done on reducing poverty, and he works a lot with multinationals and foreign nationals. So we'll let him elaborate on his background in a bit. I just want to give a round table of all the panelists. Um, we then have Susan Zenziger. Susan's based in, in New York. Uh, she has her own holding company called Utopia Ventures. She backs uh, all kinds of interesting businesses, but invests in women, Black, Indigenous, BIPOC, um, she does, you know, ticket sizes anywhere of 50 to 200K. She's working on climate solutions and she's working with lots of other initiatives around COVID, such as universal basic income, et cetera. And she'll obviously elaborate on that. Then we also have uh, Shia. So she is also from New York. So we've got two New Yorkers here. Um, and she heads up the International Organization of Employers for the UN which you know, she says is the voice of business in New York City for the UN, which has 150 employer federation members in 145 countries. And of course, she's well aware of what this has done regarding jobs and small businesses suffering from COVID. And last but not least, we have Jeffrey. Jeffrey has his own uh, practice. He's a lawyer in Chicago, and he helps fathers with divorce and also fathers. He does a lot of private initiatives to help poor fathers. He has a lot of personal experience with this as, from his own uh, growing up, and he's done remarkably well as an author, and he's advised um, President Obama in the past. And so it's great to hear uh, what Jeffrey will have to say, uh, also from a personal point of view of the importance of addressing these severe increases in poverty. So I want to first let all the panelists elaborate a little bit more on their background before we hit, hit into really the topic at hand. Um, so Donnie, why don't you go ahead and give a little bit more of a background? No, I can have the And if you can unmute your mics, uh, Donnie, that's important because we can't hear you. And Jeffrey, we'll mute Jeffrey if we can. Yes, great. Good morning, everyone. How are this community members? It's nice to be back. So uh, actually, I'm from Beijing right now. It's the evening now. So um, my background was 
uh, Sherry already talked about, I'm a, a consultant, but I also educated in US. So I lived in US for a couple of years. So I'm uh, another interesting, I've, I probably make the first donuts in China. So I was <laughs> part of a <laughs> joint ventures and, you know, setting up the joint ventures in China. So I, I would get, let other people that left Jeffrey for, for you to introduce a little bit about yourself. Okay. And it's, it's, it's for me now. Do you want to talk anything about your intercultural work that you've done with companies or anything oh. else? Okay. So currently my, my uh, professional is more like develop um, uh, cross-cultural solutions or global leadership development, you know, for uh, previously for all the multinationals in China, 90% of our clients are multinational. But in the last five years, it's been helping a lot more uh, global company, you know, Chinese global companies and going out and uh, all the global initiatives. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Um, Shea, why don't you discuss your background, what you're doing with the UN, exactly explain a bit about the Federation. So good morning to New Yorkers and good evening and good afternoon to the global world. Um, just to give a little bit of background, um, I worked at WHO, the International Labor Organization in the UN. Um, I set up a public-private partnership around apprenticeships, trying to get skills for young people and to get them into jobs. I recently moved to New York, and I am now the representative of the International Organization of Employers that represents federations, chambers of employers, large and small companies throughout the world. Um, and I'm uh, delighted to be here, but I, I, I believe, like you said, that we're um, in a time of crisis, so we need to try to find some solutions. Okay, great. And Susan, more about your wonderful background with Utopia Ventures, et cetera. Yeah, thank you. I'm very excited to be here. And Shay, welcome to New York. Uh, uh, let me know if you need any anything here. Um, so I am building Utopia. Utopia is spelled with an EU, not a U, and it's Greek for a good place, not a perfect place. And I do that in three ways. I do that through investing in women and BIPOC founders and funders. So BIPOC is Black Indigenous People of Color, for those who are not familiar with that term. Um, and uh, I invest in their funds as well as the startups that they have. Um, I also, the second way I, um, I'm building Utopia is through a farm that we have in upstate New York, where we focus and grow um, climate solutions. Um, so that's related to food insecurity, ag tech, and creating new models for farmers um, to make it work for them. And the third way I'm building Utopia is through our learning center that we're building in upstate New York. And that also tackles infrastructure issues like affordable housing. And um, as uh, Sherry mentioned, um, we have a pilot going on that is, um, it's a universal basic income pilot um, in Hudson, New York, and happy to talk more about that. Yeah, we'll little... touch base on all of this. Okay, and now Jeffrey. Hi. So just, uh, if you could elaborate a few minutes on your background and the practice a bit, we'll get into the topic after this. You're on mute, if you can unmute your mic. Let me just see if I can unmute you. There you are. There you are. Great. Go ahead, Jeffrey. I was born in Chicago, and I was a product of a divorced family. My younger brother grew up in an orphanage. I have an older sister who grew up in an orphanage. So father absence was of interest to me for quite some time. Uh, as a young lawyer, I started off in legal aid, Chicago Volunteer Legal Services Foundation, helping poor people who couldn't afford a lawyer. And I ended up involved in a lot of criminal defense work. Eventually, I, I started uh, moving into family law and helping children, fathers. Uh, I helped mothers, even though I, I do a lot of writing focused on fatherhood issues. Uh, and my law firm, the law offices of Jeffrey M. Loving Limited, has grown where we have over 20 lawyers and we help families, fathers, children all over uh, the world. And my first book that I'm really proud of, Father's Rights, has been translated. It's in English, Spanish, and it's also been translated into Chinese. And I'd be glad <laughs> to send Donnie a copy 
for free if he tells me where to send it. Uh, and, uh, I, and I've worked with law firms throughout the country. I worked with worked with law firms in Norway, uh, China. Uh, I've done a lot of work in the uh, uh, Shanghai, Beijing, and I had a business that I closed over 20 years ago that did business in China. But right now, uh, my law firm is really important in reengaging fathers with their children throughout the world. And I also chair the Illinois Council of Responsible Fatherhood, which is a government entity in Illinois. And I chair it at the pleasure of the governor of the state of Illinois. And what's interesting, uh, it was hacked. Its website was just hacked. And that was a little disappointing. And I hope that's get, that gets straightened out. But one URL that hopefully will work soon to reach it is responsiblefatherhood.com because responsible fathers are the best fathers. And uh, that's my last book I wrote is focused on responsible fatherhood. And I'm very proud that I've gotten support from the uh, uh, from uh, the former Archbishop Cardinal Francis George and President uh, Obama uh, supporting uh, supporting the book. Very proud of that book. And I write a lot of articles, too, that are published in various newspapers, uh, which is hard to do. It's, it just takes a lot of time. But uh, writing is important uh, to promoting uh, uh, my initiative. And I also volunteer for a charity focused on uh, fatherhood, the Fatherhood Educational Institute, and their website hasn't been hacked yet. The only website that I manage uh, that's been hacked so far is the government website I, I manage, and I've been told that's been hacked. Um, and I also have a radio show I have a lot of fun with every Saturday, Power 92.3 FM, and uh, it's it, I do it Saturday morning. And I don't know how I do it because it takes hours to prepare. Because- I don't know how you sleep, Jeffrey. I, I mean, honestly, <laughs> I, I can't keep up with you. I mean, I don't know how you do it, but you obviously make a great contribution and you're very passionate about what you do, which comes across yeah. um, in your in your introduction. So now let's get to the topic at hand, right? So it's really important that we, we not only say what we feel are the issues, but also what we are personally doing to address them in our remit and what we expect from others. So if I could frame this talk around, um, let's say, what do we do to fix uh, the rise of poverty because of COVID? Um, What do you think government can do? What do you think we can do on a legal basis? What can we do as a community? And ask you all to contribute to one of the three or or all three. Um, Let's start with government. And then let's talk about, um, Donnie, let's talk about the government in China, what they've been doing to address poverty. Okay, so um, thank you, uh, Sherry. But as, as everyone knows, the China uh, is a, a very different sy- a political system with U.S. So China, I would talk, because the long history, I would just talk after Deng Xiaoping took over, is after reform, after 79. Government made uh, redu- reduction of poverty as one of the top priorities. So always. So at that time, what Deng Xiaoping did is um, to change the system to let the farmer own the land. So in- enhanced productivity. So and then that helped reduce poverty. And then Jiang Zemin, he do a different things. He would do a system. It's a, make it into a county to identify the region to develop. And then to um, uh, uh, Hu Jintao, his aspiration in after 2000 is making China to be a moderately prosperous society. So, so see he have a plan. And then in, he changed it to a lot. And then in 2011 and then to, to 2000, to 2000 so it's 2000 when the pandemic hit was it was the last year of China nine years plan, 10 years plans from mm-hmm. 11 to 20. So this is a very important part of the Chinese government to uh, tackle the, uh, the uh, poverty. Actually, so when the Xi Jinping took over in 2012, he made it a reduced poverty as a top priority. So Chinese put tremendous effort, mobilized resources 
that I think the UN, uh, UN uh, World Bank keep up, uh, have uh, 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 statistics show that China actually f- in 10 years invests 800 billion US dollars into the effort effort of um, re- reduction. So they're doing many, many things. I give you an example of what they have done. So, the, so that last year, at 2000, when academic hit, it was the last years for the plan, for the 10 years plan. So government so do a lot of things to minimize the impact of that uh, pandemic. I give you an example of what the Chinese government had, you know, the fund they had do. You some, I think Sherry talked, you were very interested in one of the environment efforts. Mm-hmm. So what the government do is they hire 1. Uh, more, 1.1 million people to become the uh, forest rangers. They train them to protect mm-hmm. the forest. So they have a job now. They become government employed, become a new ranger, go out to protect all the forests. So this is a, they create a job and create problem. And then they also have an education program. So they hire newly gradu- graduate students. They give them incentive, to go to remote countryside to teach for two years. They fund them for salary, so they, they also help the kids to have a better a better school, the, the infrastructures they build. And then they have trained the uh, two-way, train the f- teacher from countryside and send the newly graduate student graduate students go to the uh, elementary school, a very remote area. So this is the one one initiative we've had done. Another one is they uh, the Chinese poverty, uh, one third of the pop, uh, poor population is in a desert area, one third. So Chinese government been doing is that the uh, for uh, desertifications. So actually what they do, they they encourage uh, people to actually to plant trees in in desert. So they calculate, give them the job, they give them all the tools to do. And that, and I give you another example is uh, like um, Alibaba. Everybody know Alibaba. Alibaba, they create very cool app. They call the NN Forest Energy. Every day, you when you pay money, you go to you you use public transportation. You do all the things. They save energy. When you save energy enough, they they award you to a tree. So that actually the tree that when they say the energy to, so that Alibaba pay the money to plant a tree in the desert. So actually mm-hmm. have your name in the desert, at the tree. The tree is, belongs to you, but in the desert. So now since 2016, now it's five years, uh, 326 million trees, 326 million trees has been planned in desert and each tree has a name. You, all the citizens, everybody use. Uh, but, but just to, so we don't get on the climate change aspect because yeah. of course that's a very important. No, so we leave but you're yeah, employing so th- people to plant those trees. Yes. So, and, and you're they, taxing, you're making the companies reinvest in initiatives that yes. will increase, decrease poverty, whether it's, it's creating kind of micro businesses, right? Which yes, is but company, company. Like these new business ventures that are popping up out of nowhere, they're putting people back to work. Yes. Okay, so that's great. I'm going to move on to someone else now. Susan, okay. why don't you tell us about, you know, government legal community? I know you can touch on all three, especially about what you're doing with City Hudson, education and universal income. Just if you can talk about those initiatives. Sure. Yeah. So we're, um, I think the universal basic income pilot that we're doing is super interesting and it's a model for what communities and eventually government could really do to reduce poverty. So the, the pilot that we're running gives people, for those of you who don't know who, what universal basic income is, it's a way for um, individuals to receive a certain amount of income per month, um, no strings attached. Um, so in our pilot, 
um, individuals are given $500 a month for a period of five years. And um, what's super interesting about that is uh, rather than having a program that dictates, oh, you need to spend the money on food or lodging, you know, food stamps or, or Section 8 or whatever it is, um, this program actually gives um, people the authority and freedom to spend the money as they see fit. Um, and we're finding some really super interesting results. We launched actually now our second cohort. Um, we did a study um, at, on first cohort now, it's been about a year, and already we're seeing that um, employment has increased from get this 29% to 63%, um, which means that people are actually having the time and impetus to be able to get the jobs that they want. Um, they're able to leave domestic situations that have been violent because they have the freedom to be able to go and and basically leave and you know pay rent or you know find you know have a new new place to live. So um, that I know is you know certainly um, you know super important. Um, their health and wellness has increased dramatically. People are healthier both mentally and physically. Um, so, you know, I'm a big believer in this universal uh, basic income and hope that kind of governments can um, adopt it. Um, what is the what's the minimum that you would provide a family or a person? Is it? Um, so we do five hundred dollars a month. OK, five hundred. That's that's our program. I mean, there are there are other programs that are testing, whether it's five hundred dollars a month or a thousand dollars a month or whatever it is. Um, and. You know, we have to remember we live in New York City right now, which is um, obviously quite expensive. But you know, with um, UBI, which is the short um, short version of universal basic income um, or unconditional basic income, uh, people don't have to live in really expensive places, right? They can afford to move to smaller towns, to places around the world where um, where five hundred dollars a month actually go a really long way. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Shay, do you want to talk about some of your initiatives that you're doing to increase jobs? I know that that explain about the crisis with the loss of jobs, et cetera. Yeah. So just to start off, um, when you're looking at the situation, when you were talking about um, where we are on the sustainable development goals that we sort of set, I'd just like to say that even before 2019, we were behind. Yeah. Um, and we weren't meeting some of those targets then, of course, with COVID and now with our recent crisis, global supply chains, jobs, refugees, all of these are really um, making the situation much worse. Now, when you said governments, governments are represented. The governments are the UN. The member states are what makes yeah. up the UN. And they set all these global policies at the local level. Of course, governments are extremely important. Now, if I focus in on the job area, um, in order to create what we call decent, climate-friendly jobs as we move into what we're calling a transition into newer and better jobs, there are certain things which really governments could be doing. Um, but I wouldn't put the blame or the the um, the uh, how shall we say, the only responsibility on governments. I think the one thing that we have to say, it's just not governments, it's private sector, it's civil society, it's everyone working together. And the reason why I focus on this area of jobs is that if you create a job, you feed a family. And so how can we in these countries to create more jobs. Now, we tend to think of jobs in the private sector as these big multinational companies. But in fact, that's not what job growth is. Most job growth is in what we call small, medium-sized enterprises. And when governments are thinking about trying to get a job growth sort of um, on, a, on a trajectory where you're going to get more people into decent jobs, one of the things you have to do is you have to think about these small, medium-sized companies, particularly when it comes to legislation, regulation, legal frameworks. And so I think that particularly if we want to focus in on job growth and in these small enterprises, particularly in developing countries, you need to even make and educate people to understand what is a small business. And what is a registered small business? Because in many companies, people are working in family businesses, which are in what we call the informal sector. So they're not even part of the formal sector, 
So they're not registered, they're not getting benefits, their workers are not necessarily getting the right benefits or salaries that they should have. So strengthening awareness about the interest of SMEs is important. Just, can I just can I just add one point there? Just um, and I want to move to Jeffrey in a minute. But um, isn't it also really about empowering the entrepreneur in whatever environment they're in? Because yeah, you have a small business, but if you can find those incentives to power the entrepreneur, that's going to fuel jobs. You know, the, those initiatives like Susan has a fund. She she helps back entrepreneurs. And I, I, I go back maybe because it's, I'm an entrepreneur. But if you really want to create jobs, you give the power mitt to people to create businesses. And then it just, you know, and, and give them those tools. And, and I think that is that's a win. I mean, in the UK, we help back businesses because we have something called EIS. So you're able to raise investment. The government um, gives you a tax incentive to investors and it helps it helps keep startups alive. So um, that's just my personal take on what you were saying. So um, it, it, can I just move on to Jeffrey? Is that OK? Um, just let Jeffrey have have a moment and then we can touch base again. Jeffrey, so with your wonderful initiatives of supporting fathers and the, the problems they have when they become divorced or have to raise single uh, children uh, from a single parent, how, how do you address the rise of poverty um, in your remit? Uh, you're, let me unmute mute you again. Here we go. Let's unmute Jeffrey. There you go. Okay, Jeffrey, go ahead. I'm addressing the rise of poverty uh, through re-engaging uh, fathers in healthy relationships with their children and supporting the family unit, just not in Chicago nationally, uh, but globally. Um, for instance, the father absence crisis in America is not just in America. It affects countries throughout the world. Uh, China, Great Britain. It's not limited just to the United States, but the father absence issue in America is significant because from the data from the U.S. Census Bureau, one out of four children live absent uh, their dad, whether biological or non-biological. And a lot of people believe, well, it doesn't matter. I think it was Dr. Margaret Mead who once said fathers are uh, biological necessities, but social accidents. But if you look at the real statistics, children that are father absence are four times, four times more likely uh, to be at risk for poverty. Um, the most reliable predictor of crime in America is father absence. Uh, mm -hmm. Father absent children, especially little girls. Uh, and if you look at page 47, uh, 46 and 47 of my first book, Father's Rights, you see that little girls are at much greater risk to be victims of sexual abuse and rape when they're absent. And I could go on and on and on. Uh, children are more likely to drop out of high school when they're father absent. Uh, so this is something that I've been trying uh, to, to work on. And it's not been easy because it's not very popular. It's not popular at all. I, I have one specific client who I did a great job for representing him. And uh, he's a billionaire, and I've asked him to contribute to a fatherhood charity, and it's just not popular. It's 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 just not a, a popular social issue, but it's a real issue. Uh, fatherless children are are more likely to engage in criminal activity, and it goes on and on and on. I've been chairing the Illinois Council on Responsible Fatherhood, which is a government agency, since. 2003, 2003, and I was appointed by a governor in 2003 in Illinois, and I've been sharing it for every governor in Illinois since, Republican, Democrat, both. It's nonpartisan. That's how important this issue is. However, there's been no government or any funding for the Illinois Council, and I've been funding it out of my own pocket since wow. 2003 trying to make a difference and trying to save the lives of children in Illinois. Now, that's only one issue. There's a charity I work with, the Fatherhood Educational Institute that I founded, and uh, and, I, and I contribute to that financially, and I also contribute my time. The new president of FEI is Maureen Gorman, an attorney, a brilliant, a brilliant attorney, and, and she's the new president. She was just elected uh, president. But that's a big issue to me. Now, the U.S., government enacted programs 
to relieve poverty during the pandemic and did a great job and did reduce poverty through cash relief expended on a, expanded unemployment benefits, expanded child tax credit. I mean, that was great. So, But the thing is, that ended last year, and it was a good temporary solution. The permanent solution would apply not only to the U.S., but every country in the world, and that's like building stronger families and, and connecting fathers with, with their children. And another issue I'd like to talk about is social responsibility of billionaires. There's one billionaire in Illinois uh, whose net worth is is quite substantial, and if he just took $3 billion out of his net worth and contributed to ending poverty in Illinois, I believe there would be no poverty in Illinois. And all that would need would be $3 billion out of his net worth, and his net worth is and, far, and, far and how, how do how does how do you get someone to to want to be philanthropic that maybe isn't or is only in other areas? I mean, I think what you just said is it's only three billion. You know, I mean, and, and to him that's that's nothing, right? So, so well, do you do personal absolutely. campaigns with him? Do you do you talk to him privately? How? How do how does it work? Because it's a combination of doing our own government initiatives and it's a combination of tapping up the billionaires to say, come on, guys, put some checks behind us. This is, you know, social responsibility. Right. Yeah. There's a um, there's an expression um, that billionaires should not. You know that you know when I, I actually I talk at high high net worth conferences and so I yeah. talk to a lot of people who have a lot of money to your point and you yeah. know there's an expression like you don't want to die you know to the billionaires you don't want to die saying um, I died a billionaire on your on your tombstone right I mean because yeah. like what's the point of it all right and uh, uh, but I also you know what's what's interesting about what Jeffrey was saying and also Shay. Um, and what, and Sherry, the point that you made is, you know, there's the philanthropic dollars, but there's also the dollars that people can put to investments. And I actually think mm -hmm. investments are as um, important as the philanthropy, right? Because investments are really about wealth creation, right? And so when you invest in the business and you create, you know, there's that, that trickle down effect. And, you know, I think we also need to focus not just on you know, what, what, what tends to happen with the billionaires is they have this incredible exit, right? Whether it's Coinbase Mafia or the PayPal Mafia, the Uber Mafia. And then you have all of these white guys who are then have all this money who are then funding other white guys who make a lot of money who then fund other white guys, right? And so, you know, we need to kind of break that cycle and, you know, have more investment dollars going towards women and, you know, black and people of color, indigenous folks, you know, so that we can really have, you know, generate wealth that isn't just for other white guys. No, it's it's a really good point, Susan. I I agree. And um, and Shay, what would you, what would you like to add to that? Yeah, I think I think the key message here is that policies matter, and we need to make sure that we're looking and addressing corruption in all countries. People don't want to invest in countries or in companies that they know are not um, the, that they're not playing by the rules, the rule of law. But also, even at the local level, small things matter. Tax incentives to small businesses, tax incentives to others. This is, as you're saying, this is wealth creation. This gets entrepreneurs excited. This is why people get excited and set up businesses. Mm -hmm. But policies matter. And I know that's terribly boring. And I'm saying this, but we can see where countries it's working. And the reason why it's working is because the government and the workers, the employers, everyone's working together to make it work for everyone and just not for the top few that are um, actually living quite well. Yeah, no, it's really important. I'll just say in my own business, I have, I think, 28 shareholders. I would say 12 are women. Many are from countries such as Nigeria, Egypt, Singapore, um, around the world. And a lot of them are British based and they have, like I said, this incentive of the enterprise investment scheme where the government gives them back 30 percent of their investment off their capital gains or income tax they've paid. Uh, and I, I think I wouldn't have had this business if I didn't have that opportunity to incentivize investors. They just they just wouldn't. And as you know, female businesses uh, are the ones that get funded the least. So this really has been initiative. And what am I doing? I'm employing people. You know, I'm implying people around the world, not just British people. I have a license to hire people from different countries. So this is uh, helping create job creation, which reduces poverty, you know, and, and I think that's one of the main solutions to 
what we're facing, right? Donnie, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? Because I know, you know, you're you're big into recreating jobs in China and and doing this. Yeah, I think like uh, Shay is saying that the policy is very important that mm -hmm. you know government is doing one thing. Maybe uh, I think UN is recognized that China has been uh, doing great job and uh, with, uh, moving people out of poverty. I think that uh, government like right right now is like like you mentioned the tax we pay is not doing very well in China that, that for tax issues, but at least they in uh, they encourage uh, companies like uh, internet companies that helping uh, the poor people in uh, the people in very remote uh, poverty um, regions to create small uh, uh, like uh, uh, online shops they train in in like in one province they have a policy the government encouraged the people that the fundings to help uh, so Alibaba another point Alibaba is also uh, investing uh, 10 million uh, dollars uh, IMB to train the farmers how to use um, internet so they they train so now we can personally i every day i buy stuff from uh very remote regions they actually ship from the from their the the, the farms directly to my store use a little very small shop online so i do that so they uh enhance their um uh the, mm -hmm. the income so otherwise they can sell anything you know so far away but now with the internet, with the help of government, the policy that encourage company that uh, give them a tax break. So then now, now they can help uh, the, the people from very remote area. And in a uh, people, one grandma is at 100 years old. She only think entertainment is making handmade shoes. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. And then they auction it online. And it can go up to very, you know, just it's like, had 20,000 US dollars for one share, one pair of shoes, and people willing to buy it. So can you imagine that otherwise without internet, this is, will never happen, but government is yeah. actually helping. So this is a story I want to share. is policy and uh, in, and then with the technology and then they yeah. can uh, reach the, 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 the connections and then with the yeah. needs and then and, and the help. Exactly. I, and and if you to say something to this, what, what would you like to add? What I'd like to add before this this ends, uh, which is an issue that is often swept under the rug because I don't know how correct this is politically, uh, but drug and alcohol abuse and mental illness contribute to homelessness. A criminal record prevents many individuals from gaining employment. So one thing that's absolutely necessary is that we need to have free mental health counseling services and yeah. housing and, and to rehabilitate those suffering from severe psychological disorders. And that should be applicable to everybody, mm -hmm. irrespective of their race, their religion, or their ethnicity. I In Chicago, in New York, and other cities, I walk around and there are people just sleeping on the streets. Oh, it's awful. In cardboard it's boxes. It's and they're awful. of every color, race, and ethnicity. It's and they're forgotten. It seems that they're just completely forgotten yeah. and, and they need help. And we we have a, a moral obligation to help yeah. these people. Yeah, I, I have to say, I used to live in San Francisco. And now when I go back to San Francisco, I find it quite shocking. If, if I'm I, if the problem of mental illness on the streets and what has happened there over the last 10 years. Okay, so if I could ask you each to say, if you had a wish list of what you would really like to see changed, what would it be? So we'll just go around a little round table here. Um, so Donnie, what would it be? If you had a wish list really quick of what you'd like to see change that could decrease poverty, what would it be? I think through education. Yeah, through education, education from, uh, from education. Yeah. Okay, education. And Shay, what would you say? Interesting. I was just going to let, uh, say that one of the things we didn't discuss was the digital divide and access to the internet, electricity, but to skills. Yeah. If employers want to create jobs, they need talent and they need the skills required. And moving people from the skills that they had 20 years ago to today to work in the new environment and these climate friendly jobs, I think it's essential that we address that. But lastly, inclusive multilateralism. 
that we work together in partnership. Yes, exactly, which is what you you probably do quite well with your organization. Uh, Susan, what would you say your wish list would be? Uh, well, I guess one of the things is to have the world adopt a universal basic income um, program um, so that everyone has a baseline. I mean, it's a it's a way to immediately um, reduce or eliminate poverty. Um, the second thing is I would encourage everyone to think not just philanthropy, but also investment, investment in women and BIPOC founders and funders of emerging um, fund managers. And, um, and I love the idea of partnership, of uh, public-private pri- partnership and, you know, having billionaires and, and folks that have wealth work conjunction and with government to establish policies. I mean, because together we can really change the world. Yes, that's a great message. And Jeffrey, your wish list, which I can kind of imagine what it might be, but I don't want to say it. So Jeffrey, you say, what would you, if you had a really big wish list, a couple items, what would it be that to reduce poverty? You'd like to see change. Ending father absence so every every child in every country could have a responsible, committed father and a loving family. That would be number one. Number two would be education and job training for everyone. And that shouldn't be limited to certain segments of society based based on wealth, ethnicity, race, or religion. Those would be my my two two most important wishes. Yeah, I I think if I had to sum this up nicely, I would say backing businesses is a way to create jobs, as we all know, but making sure policy supports that so more businesses become successful and um, can create jobs, right? Making sure that that fathers stay actively per, part of their role in the family unit, right? That does that. Getting corporations to maybe make bigger contributions to, um, to, to creating new business ventures that can stop poverty, such as what you mentioned in China, right? I think China now you say people can live on a dollar and 90 cents a day um, because you've put these initiatives in place and they can afford that. So those would be some of the, the major issues um, and how to address them. Did I, did I miss anything that we want to talk about? We've got a couple minutes left. Does anyone else want to add a point? Well, I do think that we need to focus on social responsibility uh, for, for billionaires. Um, yes. And I am yes. meeting with them and trying to motivate them. I, I mean, I, I had dinner with Warren Buffett and I tried to convince him to donate money to the Fatherhood Educational Institute. I don't know if it'll work. If it won't work, I don't know. Uh, but meeting and motivating uh, billionaires to contribute, is, it's, it's a small step, but it's a step. Oh, yes, it's a step. And it would be interesting to find those billionaires that maybe didn't have a father. And somehow, <laughs> and somehow they understood they're very lucky and, and, and they I, want and, to give back because they can't imagine, you know, they know what it's like to grow up without a father. Target those. I don't know where you find it, but but maybe that's a, a solution there. And I, you know, as I was saying, I think backing, you know, backing businesses is critical and we're going to need to do as much as we can now that we have more crisis in front of us than we've ever had. All right, we'd like to thank all the panelists. Thank you very much, Donnie, Shia, Susan, Jeffrey. Uh, We can all post this on our LinkedIn once we get the recording. Hashtag each other, keep in contact, keep building the wonderful Horizon community. And big thanks for Frank for organizing this very important panel. All right, everybody, have a- Thank you, Thank you. Thank you you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. you. Bye-bye.